welcome back and know your eyes do not deceive you i am standing next to a genuine honest to god vacuum tube computer this is the bindix g15 and it is full to the brim with little vacuum tube modules that look just like this how gorgeous is that i am absolutely in love with this machine Oh man, if I could, I would just throw it up on my shoulder and walk out of here with it, stealing it like a hoodlum, but since it weighs close to a thousand pounds, I can't quite do that. But that actually raises the question of where is here? Aside from the G15, all you're seeing is a kind of nondescript yellow wall and blue door behind me. Well, I chose this place to kind of uh, add a little bit of suspense for the reveal because I am all the way up in Maryland and this is a museum called System Source. It is mind-blowing. What an unbelievable collection of stuff. And well, Bob, the very kind gentleman who runs the museum, has been kind of letting me run rampant with the camera. So I'm gonna give you guys a really good look at what is going on in this museum. And I gotta say, if you're in the area, even if you're not in the area, come see this museum. It is absolutely worth the drive. It is absolutely worth the flight. So let's grab the camera, go around and take a look at some of the really special machines that I really fell in love with here and give you guys an idea of just what System Source is all about. I'm Bob Roswell, one of the founders of System Source. We're in Hunt Valley, Maryland, suburban Baltimore. Uh, System Source is a 43-year-old IT company. Um, computer services and sales, and along the way we've um, put together a computer museum. So we have everything here from an Apple One to a Cray One to all kinds of other um, interesting and working computers. Upon entering the main hall, you're greeted with this absolutely epic sight. Just rows upon rows of computers, like this awesome collection of IBMs. There's even a good amount of space dedicated to mechanical or electromechanical machines, like these Burroughs adding machines, or this ASR33 teletype, which I always love to see. There are also smaller displays dedicated to showing the evolution of certain technologies, like this corner dedicated to storage technology over the years. This massive hard drive was a gorgeous sight to behold, and I always love seeing a rotating drum. They look like mini nuclear reactors. Everywhere you look, there's just beautiful rows of historically awesome machines. This Intertech Superbrain, for example, which someday I would love to get my hands on one. Or this Wang 2200, which I had never actually seen in person before. There was even an Imzai 8080 and an Altair 8800 on display. But... We got to start with the machine that I made a beeline for the second I walked into this room because I saw the portrait monitor and seeing a portrait CRT is one of those things that's just incredibly rare. And when you see one, it's generally attached to something special. And this is no exception because this is a Xerox Alto. This is the genesis of a home computer. Kind of. It's got some pretty mini computer-like things on it, like this Diablo drive right here, which is a big 14-inch spinny disk, which is, I believe, two and a half megabytes. But this drive is not actually spun up at the moment. This particular machine is net booted through a beagle bone, but it is actually running the genuine hardware inside. So the machine is up and working. We can actually use it. The mouse here works perfectly fine. So I'm using a mouse from like 1972 or three or something. Ridiculous. If I hit shift question mark, I get a list of programs that I can run from here. And well, that's a pretty interesting list, but there's one on there that I think is gonna be awesome. We'll type G-A-L. I don't actually have to type the entire name. As a matter of fact, I can get away, I think, with just typing the first two letters. And then we'll go ahead and hit enter and it's gonna load for just a second. A little longer than a second. There we go. Galaxian on a Xerox Alto. How awesome is that? The only problem is that we don't know how to play it. We have figured out that uh, A and Control are, are left and right, 
but we don't know how to shoot yet. Every button we push, nothing seems to shoot. And this is not a mouse game either. We tried the mouse, but it doesn't matter because we're running Galaxian on genuine Xerox Alto hardware. Like I said, this is the Genesis and one of my favorite machines in this room. The next machine that I have absolutely fallen in love with in this room is this little HP 9807A or integral computer, I think. But uh, if you look closely, you'll notice it says HP 207 on it. And that's because this is actually a prototype for that machine. It's such an early prototype that uh, you'll notice it's missing the, uh, I believe, plasma screen that's supposed to go right here. Instead of that screen, they just got this kind of funny looking HP logo with a little composite jack on the front. But that's not what makes it my absolute most favorite machine. This thing has a Motorola 68K in it, and it is such an early prototype that it's not FCC compliant. So as that Motorola 68K and the decent amount of RAM that's in there is chugging away, doing operations, stuck in its little idle loop here, it's creating so much interference that you can hear it on the internal speaker. So while it's sitting here idling, you can hear the data bits going about their business. If, for example, we decide to push the floppy in, which it will auto mount, which I think is pretty awesome, the data bus goes bonkers. You can <laughs> It's hilarious. More computers need this feature, the feature of being able to hear the data. Playing with these old machines is such a visceral experience, and uh, sight and touch is not all of it. Sound is definitely a big part, and being, being able to hear this has just made me fall absolutely in love with this machine. I wanna give a huge shout out to CJ for getting this machine up and running for me. This is just such a cool demonstration. This is an MSI PCS8030. It is an 8085 system. It was meant to kind of be a more integrated version of the 8080 with a little more oomph behind it and able to fit on the desktop as well as be luggable. It had a ton of peripherals that could come with it like this floppy drive, but there was also printers and stuff. And like most of the things in here, this one actually runs. Once the CRT is completely warmed up, you see it says MSI PCS8030 version 1.1. Then we just have a little question mark. This is the memory monitor. We can view a specific memory location by hitting D here, and then just pick a location. We'll say uh, FFFF. That's pretty much the top of the memory. And there is something stored there. So let's display a collection of memory. We'll do D, uh, F, mm, I don't know, 000, zero, zero comma, F100. And then if we hit enter, we get a collection of memory and you can see it says MSI PCS 8030VE RS 1.1. This is the actual boot ROM that we're seeing at the very beginning. So we're looking at the code that is running the memory monitor that we're using to look at the code. It's kind of an infinite loop here thing, but that's kind of fun and awesome to see. And it breaks it up into multiple pages that we can view as we go down. Now, of course, since this is a memory monitor, you can go in and change uh, memory values to whatever you need to. But I think it is totally awesome that this machine is here working perfectly. All you got to do is flip the switch and you're right in. Before we leave the micro area, this little corner dedicated to Japanese machines caught my eye. It was quite cool seeing another Family Basic setup out in the wild. And if you want to know more about Family Basic, I have a video dedicated to it. There's a link below. There was also this epic Sharp X68K on display, which is just a gorgeous machine. However, this little corner is a shared space run by Brendan, or Inverse Phase, who does some truly stunning music work. But he also manages the Bloop Museum, which is here at System Source and showcases some unique Japanese machines. So thank you again, Brendan, for giving these obscure machines a place to shine, and thanks for hanging out and chatting. Over here in the deck room, it's full of 
well, as you would guess, plenty of deck equipment. There is a PDP straight eight over in the corner. There's a PDP five with the same CRT on it as the PDP one. And over here, there's just, well, another PDP eight, which I don't think is the right way to talk about a PDP eight. This thing is epic. It's a PDP eight I, and it's one of my favorites because they're gonna let me turn it on. So if I just take this little key here, give it a push, crank it all the way to the right, I just turned on a PDP-8i. So let's bring the camera in nice and tight on the front here. We're gonna to toggle over to some different addresses in there, change some memory, cause this thing has core memory inside of it. And then we'll look at that memory address again. So that way we can say today here in this room, I used a genuine PDP-8i. All right, I'm still just barely learning my way through this cause I've never used a PDP-8 before but uh, I think I figured out how to put some data into a uh, location. But right now we're at kind of a random place in the program counter. So we want to get it back to uh, 000 here. So we'll just go ahead and hit load address here. That put our program at 000. Let's examine that. Now it does kick us up to 01. I'm not really sure why it does that, but let's uh, load in just a little alternating pattern on this one here. We'll do maybe the first six bits or so here. Uh, and we'll do that with a deposit. Now when we deposit it, we can see that it loads our alternating pattern in here, but it also moved the program counter up by one. So let's uh, change our alternating pattern just a little bit here and we'll deposit it again. You can see we swapped our alternating pattern. We'll do it one more time here. We'll deposit it one more time. Now let's go back to the beginning and uh, do a load address examine. And this first one that we stepped up to, we didn't get quite right, but there we go. Now we've got the first one of our alternating pattern, the second one of our alternating pattern, the third one of our alternating pattern, and then we're back into different data. But there we go, we just loaded actual data that we toggled in through the excellent toggle switches here into bits of the core memory. I have a lot of learning to do before I can use this even at a basic novice level, but man, it was a ton of fun to use one of these for real. After hanging out with the decks for a bit, let's check out some of the competitors. This is a Data General Eclipse, an MV9500 to be exact. And in standard Data General fashion, the terminal is absolutely stunning. Next to the machine is the accompanying magnetic tape drive, which is in beautiful condition. But what makes the Eclipse so special is that there was a book written about it. Tracy Kidder embedded with Data General in the late 70s and chronicled the journey of building the predecessor to this machine, the Eclipse MV8000. The novel is called Soul of a New Machine and it's an absolutely fantastic read. And not for nothing, they actually mention Centurion in it, which is <laughs> pretty fun. But if I'm being honest, I love the blue and beige Nova's even more than the Eclipse, particularly the terminal and keyboard. Data General just absolutely knew how to make a good looking machine. Another system that caught my eye was this Motorola XOR Max, though the Honeywell 316 sitting on top of it is unrelated. But what really drew me in on the XOR Max system was the drive. This is a CDC Phoenix drive, just like the one that I have at home on the Centurion. Other than the drive though, I don't really know all that much about this system at all. This is a system that I am suddenly very interested in. This is a Zilog System 8000. It uses a Zilog Z8000 series CPU and is kind of an interesting bridge between the big mini computers and the desktop micros. The covers just pop right off the front with relative ease and peering in, I spy a familiar looking CDC drive. That is a Finch drive, which I also happen to have at home for the Centurion. Except this particular System 8000 has two Finch drives and a tape drive hiding out in it. All of the computer cards are in a compact little card cage. And if we slide the main CPU card out, we can get a look at some of the unique ceramic ICs hiding out on it. 
But the reason I'm so interested in this machine is that a viewer, Uncle Stewie, recently donated a System 8000 to the channel. It is almost complete. We're just missing the memory cards and the ECC card. But Bob's system is complete. So I may need to start sweet talking Bob to maybe reverse engineer some of the boards. But I'm quite excited to dig into this machine though. There's some really interesting things going on in it. Any trip to System Source would be an incomplete trip without taking a moment to walk into the Cray room here and behold the legend itself, the Cray One. And I'm about to do something that I have wanted to do for years, and Bob was nice enough to let me do it. I am gonna walk inside the Cray One. <laughs> The number of people that have stood in this very spot is tiny, minuscule. The number of people that have been inside of a Cray-1 looking at the nine million miles of wire surrounded in the extreme claustrophobic space of computing superpower. What an amazing opportunity. What an amazing feeling. This machine is legendary, but I think it's so legendary, partially because of how fast it was. It was the fastest computer in the world for like 10 years running, but also because it is absolutely stunning to look at. The semicircular shape, the wire, the water cooling, hiding out in the sofa that encompasses it. This machine is it. This is where you wanna be. And I'm there right now. This is amazing. <laughs> Just on the other side of the Bendix G15 is one of the biggest computers I've ever seen in my life, this Univac 490. This is the front control panel for it here. This is the memory. <laughs> it's more than six feet tall. And then the computer is behind this door here. And I think uh, Bob is gonna let me open these doors up. So if we pull this one open here, we can see the legions of discrete transistor cards that are plugged into the back plane. And this door opens up as well to give us a full view of that core memory. And it opens like a vault door. It's got so much weight to it. But we can see the individual core memory planes right here. There's three on this side, three more on the other side. So it gives you uh, 30K of uh, 30 bit words. So whatever the math comes out to that, editing David will put something up on the screen to let you know how many uh, bytes that is in, in modern parlance. But we can see that the core planes are just gorgeous pieces of engineering. And we can get another look at the cadre of cards plugged into the back plane. Now, if that looks daunting, like that's a lot of cards and that's a little terrifying, Wait until you see the other side of the back plane because it's all wire wrapped. So let's walk around to the other side and this is gonna freak you out, I promise. This, this is the back plane. Look at the mess of wires. If you thought DEC had trouble with their back planes and wire wrapping on it, the Univac here puts it to shame. It is, well, let's just say I'm glad I'm not the one that has to maintain this thing because this is terrifying. But also it's fascinating to see how do you connect all of those cards to each other when you don't have a printed circuit board and when each card is not standard. When we think about a backplane like something on the Centurion, it's kind of like a shared bus. All of the pins are exactly the same on each card, but that is not the case here. The cards are so small that the pins can't be exactly the same for every single card. So instead, I have a card up here that needs to connect to a card over here. So you just run an individual wire for it. And you run enough individual wires and you end up with this trampoline of wires. <laughs> it's absolutely mental. Now this machine might work, but uh, it needs a little more effort before it gets there. It is mostly complete, and Bob says this is one of his long-term projects. So I'm gonna keep coming back here and badgering Bob about it until I see this thing spin up someday, because this, this is a gorgeous work of art. 
Well, that was just a fraction of what you can see at System Sources Museum here. Bob, I want to thank you so much for having me Thanks out. Thanks for coming. This has been an absolute pleasure. pleasure. If you are anywhere in the area, even if you're not in the area, come see this museum. It is one of the greatest collections of computing history I've ever seen. He's got an honest-to-God vacuum tube computer. So come see this museum. There's so much awesome stuff. So Bob, thank you so much. Thank you guys so much. And I hope to see you next time.